Today I want to talk to you about my experience as a statistician and an R user working in industry at a tech company and some of the things that I have learned along the way over the last year. So a little bit about my story. My background is in academic biostatistics. I did my graduate work at Penn where I finished my PhD in biostat there. And then I was working as Jared mentioned in Ohio at Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve University as a faculty member. And during that time period, I was using R pretty exclusively. And so were a lot of people I, I knew as well. And the way that I wrote code was pretty much in isolation. I, I wrote code myself. Um, it didn't interact with anyone else's code. I hope that it worked. <laughs> um, and hopefully sometimes I shared it, but it, it still it was really um, in isolation. And R was pretty much the only thing. There was certainly no talk of, of SQL um, or anything else in, in that world. And then so fast forward to a little over a year ago when I moved to New York and I joined Flatiron Health, which is a uh, tech company. And now the landscape of technology is very different. R is one very small part of this environment that includes SQL, Python. At the time, there were um, also SaaS users there. So it, at first, I wasn't really sure exactly where me as a statistician fit in and also where me as an R user fit in. And so that's something I've been learning over the last year as I went. And so as I talked to you about how I've been using R at Flatiron, just a little bit of background about the company to give you some context. So our mission is that we work with oncology data to try to improve treatment and accelerate research for cancer patients. And the reason why this is important is because right now only about 5% of cancer patients are in clinical trials. And so those other 95%, they're getting various treatments and some of them work and some of them don't work and some of those patients live and, and unfortunately some of them die. And for most of those patients, their data are being collected electronically in electronic health records or EHRs, but they're not really usable for research at scale because they're in many different formats and they're siloed in different places and um, they're not really research quality. So one of the things that we try to do at Flatiron is actually process that EHR data at scale and actually make that data on 95% of patients in the real world usable and actionable. And so we do that in a few different ways. We take some of the structured data um, that is still messy and not research quality, um, but at least it's structured data, and we harmonize that. We also take unstructured data that lives deep in um, notes and um, pathology reports, and also outside information, and then we try to combine it together to make some research-grade data that we can then use to answer questions. And so who does all of this work? So you can see this is a lot of kind of um, technology infrastructure that you need for this. And in fact, it's a lot of software engineers. So I'm going to give you some numbers here from last January when I started the company. So at the time, we had about 140 people. And of those, over a third were software engineers. And that made a lot of sense. Like you saw big technical infrastructure to build all of this data to use. But at the time, we were really just starting to figure out how we use that. So there was one quantitative scientist at the company when I started. She's in the back, Melissa. Um, and so, like I said, so that ratio, 50 to 1, you know, I, I entered the company and I said, well, as a statistician and R user, where do I fit in? Well, as a tech company, we've been rapidly scaling. So in the last year, we're now over doubled in size. We have, in terms of quantitative scientists team, we have 10 people now. So we went from 1 to 10, which is a, a pretty big jump. Still, though, there's 70 software engineers and 10 quantitative scientists. So um, it, I think it's still a big question of when do we use R and, and how do we use it? And so here's some kind of some, did a little survey last week. These are very small samples, very anecdotal. Uh, the people on the quantitative sciences team, I asked what, when they started, what was their primary language? What were they most comfortable in? So you can see actually there were a lot of people who were SaaS users when they started. Um, and just a few who really thought of R as their primary language. One of them was me. And though some people had some experience with R. There were a few who had no experience, um, a lot of beginners, and then some had a little bit more going in. And early on last year, there was a decision point. One kind of late night, Melissa and I were, were talking and we were saying, well, I mean, should we be using SAS? Should we all be using R? Should we be using a combination of both? 
And I mean, of course, I wanted to use R all the time, but there's other considerations. So Melissa actually made this list, and we just moved last week, so she cleaned out her desk and found the original pro and con list. And so for on the SaaS side, there were things like, well, we work with oncology data, so we collaborate with pharmaceutical companies, and, and they're very heavy SaaS users. So it made some sense to be using SaaS from that perspective. We spent a bunch of money on a license, so we felt kind of bad if, if we didn't use it. And you know, for, for someone who that's what their background was, it, it made sense. She had experience. R, on the other side, there's some, some really practical pros and some, some kind of just more fun <laughs> pros. Um, one thing I love there, she said R was the future, which, you know, I think it is. <laughs> um, also, things, practical things like it worked well with our Macs and it integrated well with Git, which is what we use. Um, and, you know, importantly, aligned with our company values and our speed of innovation. And then there were some less practical things, like someone had a sweatshirt that she saw <laughs> and said, I think, therefore, I are. And it seemed really cool. And SAS does not have any cool sweatshirts like that. <laughs> so the decision was clear after we thought about the sweatshirts. And we decided that very night, OK, we're going to use R. And so we made the decision, but then how do we make that happen? So over the last year, we've been trying to cultivate a culture of R at the company in a few different ways. So we started off with um, an internal R package that people are either can contribute as a developer or they can put in kind of tickets for ideas for features that they want to be able to use. And now everyone on the team uses it. We also have a user group that meets once every two weeks. We have a Slack channel. Um, and if you work in tech, you probably know that the best way to get anything done is to have a Slack channel for the topic. Um, we also started off with training, some of them internally mo um, led, and then sometimes we, one day we brought Jared, our very own host here, in to come and talk about R for the day. Um, and we've been thinking about it in terms of hiring. And as I went and I made this list last week, I actually saw that there's this great post that came out last week from the data science team at Airbnb. I recommend you check this out if you haven't. And they actually outlined basically all of these steps and all the things that we've been working on for the last year as well. But they wrote about it in a much better way. So I wish someone had written that a year ago when we were figuring this out. So did this work, these things that we did? Um, very small sample, admittedly, but yes, it worked. So on the left is what the self-rated proficiency was at time of hire, and the right is I took a poll last week. And you can see that most people are calling themselves intermediate or advanced now. Um, and I've watched this change happen through just you know, watching people every day and doing code reviews, and it's been really exciting and rewarding to see. So now we have our users at the company. But it still is a question. Remember I said there were all the software engineers. There's this you know, complicated set of technology. When do we use R? It's, it's not always obvious in what situations we should and we should not use R. So I want to talk about a few examples of scenarios where we're using varying levels of R and why it makes sense for these scenarios. So the first one is when we use R for prototyping and then we use something that's not R in production. One example when we use this is for linking external mortality data. And so we do oncology research, so of course we care a lot about survival analysis and mortality. And we had some internal data and we had some external data as well. And so when we were linking them, our first prototype, um, this was something that um, I implemented and it was just me working on it, so it made a lot of sense for me to use R. And it was a one-time linkage for a smallish cohort of just a few tens of thousands of patients. And I used the record linkage package in R. It has a probabilistic linkage method using a variation of the EM algorithm. It works really well for this case, and it was easy to implement. Then when we moved this into production, where we were doing this at scale every day on about 5 million patients, it was possible we could have used R, but we actually really thought really critically about should we use R in this case, or are there, are there alternatives that might work better? And in fact, uh, some of the things that we considered were that the code was maintained by a different team. So one thing about being in a rapidly scaling startup is you don't stay working on the same thing for a long time. You work on it, you get it to a good place, and then you move on to the next team and the next project. Um, so this would not be something that I would be continuing to work on. So what we ended up doing is we actually I collaborated with a few software engineers on the team who can write SQL 
um, much better than I can. And we were able to collapse kind of that probabilistic method into a set of deterministic decision rules and implement the logic in SQL. And it works um, not quite as well as the probabilistic met linkage method, but approximately as well. Like it was good enough for our use case and we can do it easily at scale every night. And in, in this case, I think this was actually really the right choice and it made a lot of sense because one reason was this was a stable method. We weren't going to be doing a lot of rapid iteration after we got the first prototype done of the SQL-based method, so um, it could just be put in place and not necessarily having to change it all the time. Also, the original one had some tuning parameters that really kind of took some care to pay attention to, and so this was a little bit easier to just kind of implement and then, um, and then just put aside. Um, also, it had similar performance, but more transparency. So that's important here because, like I said, people are moving to different teams all the time. And so at a rapidly scaling startup, documentation is really important because the person who's working on something now is not the person who's going to be working on it in three months from now. So the person who comes in to work on it needs to be able to read kind of a wiki page and completely understand the process. And so the more transparent something is, that's actually a huge advantage in this world. And, and lastly, like I said, the team that was going to be maintaining the code, it didn't happen to have anyone from our quantitative sciences team or anyone who was an R user. So to actually leave behind some R code that other people would be maintaining, they might not really want to, or if they ran into problems, they might need to pull us in a lot. That wasn't necessarily practical in this case. So the next example is very different. It's R is actually a very long-term solution. And the use case here is for um, a series of QA reports we do. And these are really critical for us because we have kind of continuously updating data from a lot of sources that we're combining and harmonizing and transforming in a lot of ways. And the underlying source data are always changing and our manipulations on the data are always changing. And so, and it's also very messy data, the source data. So in order to know when things go wrong and be able to, to see what's happening, it's a really non-trivial problem. And so we do a lot of continuous QA monitoring of the data. And in this case, the early version was actually um, prototyped by um, one of my colleagues, Alphan, in um, last January. And the current version has a lot of improvements, but it's still kind of at its bones, very similar. Um, and he implemented something where he actually used an R script to run um, bash commands that would extract data using one of our ETL tools. And that was run via the command line with various different parameters. At the time, we actually had a meta file that we manually updated some of the parameters. And this runs a series of our markdown files and renders HTML output, that, HTML output that has some really cool visualizations and some cool statistical analyses and is really helpful in letting us, allowing us to kind of um, monitor what's going on and act on it. And so the current version is kind of, like I said, at it, its heart, very similar but it's now much fancier in a lot of ways, and it's really evolved over time. It's been great to watch. So now we have it linked to a data pipeline that's actually maintained by software engineering. And that meta file we used to update manually, now we generate that dynamically through a shell script. We use Plotly for some, some really great interactive survival curves. We have a really beautiful uh, bootstrap theme that makes it look really nice. Um, and our plan is to continue using R for this indefinitely, actually, in this case. And why did this make sense here, but not for the other case? So partly because this was living on a very mature product and team, and that team also had quantitative sciences members from the beginning and will probably forever, or at least as long as the team exists. So there was always someone there to maintain it and to develop in it. Um, also, we you know, had a really great um, partnership and support and collaboration with the software engineering team who kind of recognized the value of keeping this in R so that we could continue to do rapid prototyping and rapid iteration because the requirements that we had were dynamic. They were changing over time, so we needed to be able to be constantly evolving and responding to those changing requirements. So the last example is um, kind of a hybrid of those two, which is where we're using R and then also not R in parallel. And this makes sense in some examples we're doing now with um, some of our external collaborations. And those are typically involving specific research questions. 
And what we're doing is we're actually having two people um, write code independently, um, usually one a software engineer and one a quantitative scientist, and in kind of over some combination of maybe Python and SQL, and then also an R and comparing the results. And so the language choice here is somewhat incidental. So it, it's a nice feature that we're doing things in two different languages. But really, the big point here is that it's more about two different perspectives, two different people coming from completely different approaches and independently implementing something. And so we can have a lot of confidence then in the results. And this makes sense in cases where, for example, the stakes are really high. It's very important. And maybe the, toler the error tolerance is very low. Like if we actually got something wrong, it would, be, you know, it would be very bad in this case. And so we're not willing to make a mistake. Um, also, for complicated concepts, so the data that we work with, it's very clinically complex, and it's not always as trivial as just saying, oh, you know, just write the code to see um, how many cycles of this one chemotherapy a patient got. Um, there's actually a lot of nuance involved in there, and it's very easy to get it wrong. Um, and, you know, in fact, like I said, these are specific custom research projects, so often that really involves novel problems. So doing something we've never done before, and when we're doing something for the first time, there's a lot more risk involved of getting it wrong. And so this is something that, that we're going to keep doing, where R definitely has its place, um, but also something that is not R has its place as well. And so I just want to you know, thank all the people involved. The examples that I've mentioned have been kind of the effort of a lot of people. Um, and you know, these are just some of our quantitative sciences and um, engineering allies and other R users at the company. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to put out a shameless plug for that we are hiring. <laughs> so feel free to find me on Twitter or email me, Sandy Griffiths, um, to join our team. Thank you very much. <laughs>